the most unhealthy state in America with the worst longevity. It is a complicated discussion because it's not quite as simple as just picking a state and saying, oh, that state's in the South, that's unhealthy. We need to look at a lot of things. We need to look at socioeconomic factors, sociodemographic factors. We need to look at walkability, physical activity. We also need to look at, of course, the metabolic factors, levels of processed food intake, levels of sugar, levels of saturated fat. All of this matters, and we need to find the common themes and the common denominators to find which state really has the biggest problem. For example, income level plays a huge, huge part. There was a study that was published in JAMA, JAMA. It was a 1.4 billion, with a B, person study. This probably is one of the scariest statistics that I've seen in a while. The top 1% earners in the United States, compared to the bottom 1% earners, have a 14.6% longer life expectancy in men and about a 10.1% in women the top 1% compared to the bottom 1%. So as far as life expectancy is concerned, it's pretty clear there, but it gets worse. When you look at the trajectory in which people are improving their lifespan, it's not moving linearly based on income. The top 5% earners over a 10 year period have improved their lifespan, their life expectancy, approximately 2.3 years whereas the bottom 5% earners have only improved their life expectancy 0.22 years. So it's getting worse. The more the income, the more the ability to attain a better life expectancy. But we really need to understand why, because it's not just healthcare, because I've done videos before that have actually looked at the rate of life expectancy over healthcare and this and that. And the United States spends a ton of money on healthcare and it doesn't necessarily equate to a better life expectancy compared to other countries that spend way less on healthcare but have better life expectancy. So we can't just say it's only that. It's also like, okay, lower income, are they eating more processed food? Are they uh, not affording gym memberships? Are they... The list goes on and on and on and on. But let's break this down more and understand which states are truly the unhealthiest. So let's look at processed food intake because there is a study published in BMC Open. It's a pretty large study as well. It went from 2007 to 2012. So I know it's a little bit old. They were looking at ultra processed food intake in the United States. And by the way, this has only gone up <laughs> since 2012. The first most alarming thing with this is that over 60% of the calories consumed at this particular date, this time, were from ultra processed foods or at least from processed foods. So it didn't matter where it was, 60% was the average. That is frightening. But younger people were the biggest consumers of ultra processed foods. Then there was a correlation between income level and processed foods. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It wasn't as much as people would have thought. Lower education status, that was a big driver for buying more ultra processed foods. Then also non-Hispanic white people ate more processed foods and non-Hispanic black people ate more processed foods. Now, this was largely grouped together. Essentially what it was inferring was that people that were born in another country and came over more than likely still held on to their culinary traditions and probably ate at home. So what we can look at when we start to dive into this more is, okay, if people are born and they're relatively low income in the United States, it's a high chance that they're going to consume a lot of processed foods. But a lot of times, even if they're lower income, if they are foreign born, they find a way to eat at home. Like for example, I have a lot of Mexican friends and they do eat at home a lot. They do. They, it may not be the quote unquote healthiest food, but it's probably a lot better than processed food. At least it's whole foods. Maybe it's beans and rice and tortillas, but at least it's whole food, right? The interesting thing is that income was correlated with the processed food intake, but not as much as you would think. As a matter of fact, this study actually states, this study counters the stereotype that low income individuals are higher consumers of ultra processed foods because of the price. We do need to accept the fact that yes, income plays a huge role in choosing convenient, inexpensive processed foods. But a lot of times it's just sheer convenience too. So 
being able to have access to foods that are healthier, that are still convenient at a relatively affordable price is really, really important. I put a link down below for Thrive Market. I know this is a relevant pitch for them, but at the same time, it makes sense. There's a 30% off discount link down below. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store, and it literally is their mission to make healthier food more available for people in areas that cannot get healthier food. They really wanted to make sustainability a real thing and be able to get real good unprocessed and even healthier processed food options into people's hands. So that link down below is a 30% off discount link for whatever you choose. You can fill up your grocery cart using that link, 30% off plus a free $60 gift. So 30% off whether you choose some beet chips or whether you choose Siete tortilla chips instead of regular corn chips, or if you want jerky snacks or this or that. And a lot of the times it's gonna be much, much cheaper than you would find at many grocery stores. So that link is down below. It's in the top line of the description underneath this video. And again, 30% off and a free $60 gift. Now, I still believe that income is a huge driver for who's going to choose processed foods. I really do. But I do think that convenience plays a big part as well. But when you look at the data, it's hard to deny that income and foreign-born versus non-foreign-born don't make a difference because they seem to when you look at the literature. So let's look at the states that have the lowest income and the lowest level of foreign-born. Number one with the lowest life expectancy is Mississippi with a life expectancy of about 73.9 years. They are the lowest income level per capita and the third lowest level when it comes down to foreign born. And they happen to have the worst life expectancy. Okay, well, that's one. Well, let's look at West Virginia with a life expectancy of 74.3 years. In this case, they have the second lowest level of income in the United States, and they have the first lowest level of foreign born. So things are really starting to add up here. And then if you look further, the bottom nine for life expectancy are all Southern states. In this case, we have Alabama, Kentucky, Louisiana, Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and of course, Mississippi and West of Virginia, as already mentioned. Okay, well now we need to start understanding the metabolic piece more because we know they're eating processed foods, but what about sugar? Are they eating more sugar? Which states consume the most sugar? Well, there was a study that was published in the journal Nutrients that looked at 52,000 participants across all 50 states. On average, in America, people consume about 17 teaspoons of sugar per day. That alone is frightening. So America is not on a good path to begin with. Overall, with life expectancy, with ultra-processed food consumption and calories from processed food, and definitely issues with sugar. Well, the South takes the cake for the most sugar consumption. So not a huge surprise there, with number one being, drum roll please, Kentucky in this case. Now, Kentucky still has a low life expectancy. It was definitely still in the running there for one of the lowest, but their sugar intake is the highest at over 22 teaspoons. Then next up, number two, we have our good friend Mississippi once again. Okay, it's not looking good for Mississippi across the board. Number three, guess what it is? West Virginia. So Mississippi and West Virginia, a lot of overlap with all these things here. Then we have Oklahoma, we have Arkansas, and it kind of trickles down to the usual subjects. You know, you've got the uh, Alabama, the Georgia, Florida, all that with their high sugar consumption. A lot of it just kind of way of life. And you know, a good majority of the sugar is consumed in beverages. So if you go to the South or you live in the South, you know there's sweet tea, there's pop, there's all this stuff that they drink all the time. So Unfortunately, a lot of the calories are coming in in the form of liquid calories, which there's evidence that suggests that that's one of the worst things when you look at overall metabolomics and you look at fat deposition and you look at just the metabolism in general. So let's table that for just a second and let's look at fat intake. Here's what's wild. There was a study published in The Lancet that looked at fat intake and it might surprise you. This study was 135,000 people over 7.4 years and they found that the highest risk of death as far as diet was concerned wasn't from a higher fat intake, it was from a higher carb and sugar intake. So the highest places having over 77% of their calories coming from carbohydrates. And this led to a 28% increase in their risk of dying. Whereas a higher fat intake only increased at 23 to 24%. Still a lot, but not as much as the carbohydrates. And drum roll please, saturated fat 
only increased the risk by 14%. So have we been looking in the wrong places? In fact, Dr. Mashid Degan even mentioned with this study that lower to middle income groups actually have a bigger problem with consuming too many carbohydrates and sugars than they do fats, with a good majority of their calories coming in from refined carbohydrates and sugars, not so much the fats that we tend to point our finger at a lot. Now, don't get me wrong, in the state of overnutrition, when you're consuming a lot of fuel, fat is problematic too, especially saturated fat in what is called an overnutrition state. When you're eating too much food to begin with, saturated fat exponentially becomes problematic in a surplus. But for the most part, we are really looking at a lot of the wrong places, especially with ultra processed food. It's that high refined carbohydrate intake and just rampant ingestion of calories in that mechanism, that method, that is really an issue. But then of course, we have to look at physical activity too. Because if you look at some really big, huge studies, like the UK Biobank study that was in BMC Medicine, looked at almost a half a million people, it was very clear in this study that more physical activity directly equated with lower risk of all-cause mortality. There's no denying that being physically active is the best possible thing. So you can outrun a bad diet quite a bit. It's not gonna guarantee success, but you can really outmove a lot of damage if you're actually moving. The problem is, is that in America, a lot of us are sedentary. But if you look at the chart that is on the screen right now, it shows the darker the red the state, the least active it is. Okay, with some of these southern states having a prevalence of inactivity of over 30%. That means over 30% of the population is straight up inactive. So in this case, that 30% prevalence is going to be in these states when you look at the chart. Mississippi, once again. West Virginia, once again. Oklahoma, Louisiana, Alabama, and Kentucky. So then we have to ask ourselves, are these states walkable? Like that's a huge thing. When we were comparing Europe to the United States in a video a few months back, one of the big things we looked at was the fact that Europe is highly walkable compared to the United States. But if we look domestically, just the United States, like what areas are the most walkable and least walkable? There was a study published in 2020 that found that the least walkable cities are Orlando, Atlanta, Indianapolis, and San Antonio. Again, most of the case gonna be Southern. It's kind of interesting because even the states that are really cold, friggin' Fargo, right? Like North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, they are more active than the Southern states that have pretty fair weather a lot of the year. So it's not a weather thing, although that could play a part. I mean, look at California on the map. California, if you look at most things, you would think, oh, this is gonna be a green state where everybody's active. Like only a couple of green states. So weather isn't necessarily the driving factor. California also has a lot of walkable cities. So I find that kind of interesting, right? And you look at a state like Washington, which is green, it's raining all the time in Washington. So they're highly active, but even though it's raining, so we can't say weather plays the 100% part. I think there's a lot of different factors. I think this is also where income comes into play too. If people are having to work for 16 hours every day just to make ends meet, and there's a lot less overall education and less income, and you're working more, convenience becomes a factor. You don't have time to exercise. You definitely don't have time to walk to work or walk to the store because you're working 16 hours a day. The other eight hours you need to spend sleeping. So then your sleep quality goes down, your sleep timing goes down, all these things add up. But if I had to pick the states that would be the worst, it looks like it's Mississippi, West Virginia, Oklahoma, and Kentucky. And if you live in those states, you need to take it on yourself to really educate and make good decisions. There are options available. A lot of times you have to go online, but they're there. You just have to educate yourself. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.